Now we get to hear about the parables. The parables contain the heart and substance of some of what Jesus had to teach us about what it means to follow him and what it means that the kingdom of God has come. So Jesus uses the parables to make a point by making a parallel. He uses images of things that were commonly known by everybody and uses them to make an analogy about faith or the kingdom of God. You know, the deal is it was really hard to say exactly what the kingdom of God is. So instead, Jesus says, the kingdom of God is like. It is like a mustard seed that is so small you can barely see it, but it grows into a huge bush so big that birds come and make nests in it. It's like a son who ran away from home, got in trouble, and was welcomed back. The kingdom of God is like finding a pearl so valuable you want to sell everything just to have it. Now, parables are not intended to be literally true. Instead, they are intended to make us wonder and to lead us to grow into a deeper understanding of what Jesus says and of what the kingdom of God is and how Jesus leads us to live in following him. So we'll start with a couple of parables. The first one is a parable of the Good Samaritan. It comes from uh, chapter 10 in Luke. It reads, so just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus saying, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, well, what's in your law? And the lawyer said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said, that's the right answer. Do this and you will live. Now, wanting to justify himself, maybe looking for a loophole, he asked Jesus, okay, just who is my neighbor? And Jesus said, a man is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was beaten by robbers, and he stripped him and beat him, and he went away, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was walking in that road, and he saw the man, and he passed by the other side. Also, an expert on the law passed him and went away on the other side. And then a Samaritan was traveling, and he came near, and he saw him, and he was moved with pity. And he went and bandaged the wounds, and having poured oil and wine on them, and he put the man and his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out the equivalent of two days' wages, and he gave them to the innkeeper, and he said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. So Jesus asked them, which one of these three do you think was really the neighbor to the man who was beaten by the robbers? And the lawyer said, the one who showed mercy. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. A couple of interesting things in this parable. The lawyer is an expert on what it means to uh, be a good observant Jew. He was all focusing on following the law, but he was looking for a loophole, trying to figure out just how much do I have to love? Are there people I don't have to take care of? So Jesus told this story about this man who was beaten up by robbers and a priest avoids him. A Levite, who's an expert on Jewish law, avoids him. But a Samaritan helps the man. Now, back then, Jewish people did not regard Samaritans as being equal to them. They regarded Samaritans as well, less than they were. They were like they, they regarded them as like kind of half Jewish, not really Jewish, not Jewish enough. So they looked down on them and, and, and thought they were unclean. But it was a Samaritan who did God's will. One of the things Jesus teaches us here is following God and living in the kingdom of God is not just about following rules. It is about loving. That is what Jesus teaches us. So when we hear this story, one of the challenges for us is how do we see ourselves in this story? Do we see ourselves like the religious people that are too busy to help the guy? Or do we see ourselves like the Samaritan who will stop and help? Part of what this teaches us is it is more important to follow the intent of the law, to love, than simply following the letter of the law exactly what it says. Here's another parable, the parable of the lost sheep. This is from Luke chapter 15. It starts out saying, now, the tax collectors and other sinners were coming to listen to Jesus. And 
the Pharisees and the scribes, they were grumbling and saying, that Jesus eats with sinners. He welcomes them. So Jesus told them this parable. Which one of you, if you had 100 sheep and lost one, would not leave the 99 sheep in the wilderness and go after the one that's lost until you find it? When you find it, you put it on your shoulders and carry it home, right? And when he comes home, he calls together your friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, I found my sheep. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So in this story, Jesus is accused by the religious big shots, the religious know-it-alls of his time, and they're accusing Jesus of being unclean. They're saying, look at that. He eats with sinners. And Jesus said, okay, let's look at sheep. One sheep gets lost. 99 are safe. So in a story, who do you suppose Jesus is talking about? Maybe the religious big shots? Maybe one of them is lost? Hmm? The lost sheep might well be the sinners and the tax collectors. Tax collectors back then, by the way, were regarded as a special kind of sinner because tax collectors were typically uh, young Jewish men who grew up in the town who were a second or third born and would not inherit property or a job and a way to make a living. So they sometimes would work for the Roman government and they would collect taxes for the Roman government from their own people. And what made matters worse is they were paid on commission. So they were told that they had to collect a certain amount of money for a particular village. Whatever they collected beyond that, they got to keep for themselves. They were pretty unpopular. So I wonder if the tax collector here might be the lost sheep, the one who needs saving. And what happens to sheep if they get lost? Well, they die. Sheep need to be in a herd, in, in a flock, in order to live. They don't have very good defense mechanisms. They can't run well. They're afraid of just about everything. And when they get lost or stuck, sometimes they'll just stand still and not know what to do. So the sheep in the story are all the people Jesus is talking to. And the sheep in the story also include us, don't they? And there's times that we can be the lost sheep. There's times we can be the good sheep. Either way, Jesus says, we all need them. We all need him. New parable, also in chapter 15 of Luke. The parable of the lost coin. He said, or imagine a woman having 10 silver coins and she loses one. Wouldn't she light a lamp, sweep the whole house and search all over until she finds it? And when she finds it, she'll tell her friends and say, oh, rejoice with me. I lost a coin and I found it. Jesus said, just so I tell you, there is much joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So again, Jesus points out here that the big deal is being reunited with God, being found by the kingdom of God, being welcomed back into God's love and God's arms. Then there's a story of what's often called the prodigal son. Jesus said there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said, Dad, I want you to give me the part of the estate that's going to come to me. So dad divided his property between his sons. A few days later, the younger one left and went to a faraway place, and he squandered everything he had on dissolute living, prostitutes and drinking, and everything else. After everything was gone, a famine came, and he was in deep need, and he was hungry. So he got a job in that, in that area. His job was feeding pigs in the field. Oh, he would gladly have eaten what he ate, what he fed the pigs, and nobody gave him anything. And then one day he said, my dad's hired hands have enough bread to eat, even more than they need, and here I am dying of hunger. I know what I'll do. I'll go to my dad and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer even worthy to be called your son, but could you treat me like one of your hired hands? So he got up and started heading home. And while he was still far away, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. And he put his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said, Father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And his dad cut him off. And he hugged him. 
And he said to his slaves, quickly, bring a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Get the fatted calf and slaughter it. Let us eat and have a party. For I thought my son was dead, and he's alive. He's lost, and he's found. And they began to celebrate. Now the older son was out working in the fields. When he came to the house, he heard the party. And he called one of the servants, and he said, what's going on? And the servant said, well, your brother's come home. And your dad killed the fatted calf and are having a party because he's back safe and sound. Well, the, son, the older son got angry and refused to go in. When his father came out, the son said to him, look, for all these years, I've been working like a slave for you. I've done everything you've told me to, and you've never given me even a young goat so I can have a party with my friends. But when that son of yours came back, the one who wasted your money with prostitutes and drinking, you kill the fatted calf for him. And the father said, son, you've always been with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate because your brother was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he's found. This is a very moving story, a very moving parable. It talks about love and mercy and grace. Some interesting things happen here. One of them is, did you notice what the older son says? He gets all angry that dad welcomes the younger son back. He thinks, well, this kid can do whatever he wants, and I'm the one who has to be the responsible one. Uh -huh. So when we hear the parables, we get to see ourselves in each one of the characters in the story. The older brother doesn't react well, he's angry. But dad reacts with mercy and grace. And the truth is, each of us can be each of the characters in the story at different points in our lives. But the main point is what Jesus teaches us here, that God is merciful. And the kingdom of God is about bringing love and mercy into the world. And as followers of Jesus, this is how we are called to live too, to repent to come back to God, and to rejoice and celebrate with others when they also are brought back. But most of all, these stories tell us God is love, God forgives. It's not, you know, following God is not, following Jesus is not just about following rules. It is about how we will live. Will we live lives of mercy and grace and imitate Jesus the way he lived?